Welcome to the Art of Disability Culture. My name is Fran Osborne. I am the guest curator for the show, and I'm here at the wonderful Palo Alto Art Center, where people exhibit art, they make it, and they discuss it. Hello there, I'm Javier Jimenez Jr. I'm here with, what's your name? Maya Scott. Alrighty, and then who is this with us as well? And this is Gleam. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the, uh, uh, your exhibit that you have here on display. I have a piece uh, in three parts, an installation called In Sight, In Sight, In Sight. And it's all labyrinth-based work, um, really related to, I was thinking about it later on that it, almost feels a little bit self-portrait-ish um, or autobiographical in the sense that um, I like to think my sight is impaired but my vision is quite clear and that we all see the world in such different ways. So I have a, um, a large-scale walkable labyrinth made of about um, 650 um, ovals stamped with my eye and there's a hanging cube in the lobby with a hand labyrinth that's kind of suspended in the middle, and there's four pieces and a couple activities in the little creativity space that are touchable and tactile. Okay, and then tell us a little bit about why you think exhibits like this are important. Wow, I think, um, I don't know, the disability culture is... Um, big and powerful and interweaves into um, so many elements of society, whether we identify with it, claim it, um, obtain it or not, thinking about how one in five of us, or um, depending on the numbers you look at, one in five or one in four, um, uh, have a disability at some point in our lives or have a disability right now. And whether we are fortunate to age or not, or we're born with it as such, you know, as I was, um, there's so many artists and people uh, in history. I'm thinking of like Van Gogh and Toulouse and Toulouse-Lautrec and um, dancers like Alicia Alonso, who uh, was blind. And we're out there, we're making art, we're telling stories. And this exhibit is so important because disability doesn't really show up in a lot of stories. In a lot of cultures, it's something that is often hidden and even I did up through college, I didn't want to be caught dead looking like I had anything that made me look blind. So people would ask me, um, you know, what, did, what are you on and can I have some? So um, uh, it's really empowering to be able to tell this story and basically say, this is my life. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm uh, here with one of the artists here. Can you tell us our, uh, your name real quick? Michaela Ottery. Michaela, Michaela, okay. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, piece you have on display here today? Yep, um, I have two pieces on display here today. Um, my self-portrait and um, a piece of Stacy Park Milburn, who unfortunately passed away last yeah, actually, year. Yeah. Um, so uh, should I like describe them or <laughs> okay um, yeah so the point of my portrait series there it's called the disabled beauty series um, because it's it's all about embracing you know that we are beautiful individuals we um, all disabled people are just so wonderful and deserve to see themselves in you know, in a good way. So I, I love this portrait series. I love creating so many portraits of so many different people. 
um, from all kinds of backgrounds. It's, it's just really important to me. And then lastly, do, can you tell us a little bit about why you think exhibits like, uh, let's see real quick, uh, the art of disability culture is important. Why is it? It's so important because um, disabled people are so rarely featured in ways like this. And it might be hard to believe, but um, disabled people are actually the largest minority in the world because there are disabled people in all different cultures in all backgrounds and all races and everything there are disabled people well, everywhere and we just ignore it a lot of the time so it's so important and so exciting that we get to be featured in an exhibit like this and i hope that there are many more that i can participate in or that other disabled people can be featured in all over the place <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. Hello there, I'm here with, what's your name? Rachel Ungerer. Rachel, uh, so tell me, what, tell us a little bit about your piece that you have on display here. I have a series of six pieces on display here, and they're in many ways about what it's like to live as someone with an invisible disability, um, kind of good and bad. I had no idea what that felt like before I became disabled so I just kind of wanted to share that with the world and one side I was finding really valuable is the vulnerability in disabled people is often seen as a weakness but I think it can actually be a really powerful strength and a way to gain connection and intimacy and also was still showing all the ableism that has to be endured and the being kicked off the bus and the doctor who doesn't believe you because you don't look disabled. So I was kind of trying to acknowledge the good and bad and have pride for who we are through all of it. Okay, and then finally, tell us a little bit about why you think exhibits like this are so important. I think exhibits like this are really important because even I learned a lot through this exhibit, and I, I try my best to be a part of the disabled community, and I learned so much from all the other artists. And I think art that really challenges you to ask yourself, what is my position in the world, and how is that different from the people around you is really valuable. Alrighty then, uh, I'm here with, what's your name? Catherine Leche Chong. Catherine Leche Chong, Alrighty. And then tell us a little bit about the piece you have on display here today. Okay, I have paintings on display behind me. They are um, acrylic and they're tactile. Um, I make them so even if um, someone cannot see, they can actually feel the paintings. Um, and I started with the colors first. Um, I just started painting large canvases of color. It was a frustrating isolation pandemic time. And then I started pairing the, uh, the portraits with the colors. So the first one was the cobalt blue version. It was actually right before the pandemic, yes. I was working on it. Right and uh, I painted it all blue, cobalt yes. blue. Yes. And then I painted her with the baby and the halos. And then I made many, many layers, hundreds Sorry. of white layers over it. Um, and that's how the White Blindness uh, series started. I, so. I realized that is the experience of some, some of us with blindness is that light um, actually harms our eyes. Hence, we wear dark glasses. It's not, not to be cute. And um, so I would pick the personages for them. Next one I did was Quinacridon Gold. And I thought, mm, guru. I studied in India. So it's Quinacridon Guru that one, uh, all the way to the last one, which has two persons in it. And it's called Bone Black, which is a color, and Lila's White, another pink color, and two ladies with lamps. Well, I think it's behind you here somewhere. Yes, there is two ladies with lamps, like right here behind us, too. Those happen to be two nurses that were in the Crimean War that most people don't know about. They just know about Florence Nightingale. So I found out about Mary Seacole, who is very famous in Britain. She also has a statue in London. 
And I started working on that piece. And I do research when I do it. I, I read books, their stories and all that. So it's really satisfying for me. And the color is really satisfying for me to work with. But then ultimately in this series, I'm exploring the perception of some kinds of blindness. And that's why it's the white blindness series done during the pandemic. They're called the isolation icons. And also in them, I use a lot of tactile letters and words. And also there is clear braille in them so that one can come up to them and read stories or quotes or meditation teachings because I'm a meditation teacher also. <laughs> Artie, right, thank you so much for telling us about that. I didn't even know that about the glasses. Um, before I let you go, I wanted to ask one more question. Why do you think exhibits like this are so important to have? Wow. <laughs> Diversity. One more, all I can think of. The more diverse we can be and the more we can connect also in that diversity, diversity we can solve more problems. We can be much more creative. Um, so I, I see uh, not, my pr not so much as a person with disabilities, but um, also being able-bodied, um, just a person who is differently abled. If I'm differently abled and someone else is differently abled and we can solve something together, that's great. And I think for, for the young people, education-wise, um, okay. to show that diversity, there's always a way. Um, there's always a possibility. And that's what it means for me. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Hello there, I'm here with, what's your name? Mathis Lamb. Mathis, so tell us a little bit about the uh, displays you have here at the exhibit today. All right, so outside in the main entrance is a life-size sculpture of an elephant made out of recycled materials, such as uh, paper towel rolls, uh, egg cartons, and paper cup holders. Okay, and uh, tell me a little bit about why you think uh, exhibits like this are so important to have. Well, the one I made was to help raise uh, awareness about uh, protecting wildlife and recycling. Do you want a wide shot or do you want me to try and get closer? Like that?
everybody, and welcome to the Art of d the d d Disability Culture and Community Day. Give it up for yourselves. Excellent. And there's lots of ways to show your love. You could always clap. You could always do do the waves um, the, in, in the air. You could also woo, but don't yell too much. Like, you know, some of us don't like the loud, loud no, 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 no noises, but there's always ways to show your love. So hopefully you will be showing your love to the artists that will be joining us this afternoon. Um, I, I am the San Francisco Bay Area's only female stuttering stand-up comic. Thank you, appreciate that. And I am part of a comedy troupe called the Comedians with D D D Disabilities Act. So it's me, a guy who uses a wheelchair, another guy who's blind, and another guy who's a little person. And people come up to me all the time and they say that stuttering and dyslexia, because okay. I also have that, I've got a red that those on. aren't real disabilities, and I shouldn't be in that comedy troupe. And I tell them if you look at the, the definition of what a disability is, according to the Americans with the Disabilities Act, it's a physical or mental impairment that substantially results and I'm in having to deal with jerks. It's, okay, program is so, pretty sure, pretty sure it qualifies. I usually say a different word than jerks, <laughs> as, as many of you know. <laughs> I'm on Feel three. free to insert whatever word you would like there. Um, kind of the okay, well, nativities of d dirty comedy. Um, so green is there live. is this thing that sometimes happens when I perform. Yeah, green um, is live, red is And live. that is sometimes the audience when they're very, you know, they, they um, want to show their compassion to me as a stand-up comic, but they kind of don't d do it right. Because I'll be performing my jokes at, at a nightclub and very well-meaning people especially women sometimes, they will look at each other in the audience and they'll do this. Okay. Oh, 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 I make eye contact. Oh, oh. They pity mommy. me. <laughs> Which I love sympathy just like all of you, but I don't know why it has to be in the middle of my act. Like, what is that the time? Because it's not my everyday life. No, of course not. It's not like when I go to Starbucks and I place my order and the barista says, is that Nina okay, with so five that's what N's? I get when I zoom in. Where's my pity moan then? No, it's always straight in my act. It's the only time. All right, so I'm gonna leave you with one joke. This is a, jo a safe joke. Safe joke that you can tell at your office you know, kind of ad ad advocacy things, especially as an ally, I think this joke is important. So here it goes. How many disabled people does it take to screw on a light bulb? Oh, okay, so um, call and response, everybody. I see why I'm the comic up here and you're the audience. Um, Melanie, I'm, I am d d disappointed. Um, <laughs> so, She's also a comic. Uh, all right, so we're gonna try that one more time, and you're gonna say how many, but don't stutter on it, because I'll be mad. Okay, all right, so here we go. How many disabled people does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? One to screw it in, and five able-bodied people to say, you are such an inspiration. I heard some l laughter from the back, which is a great time to introduce our first performer, who many of you have already met. And, and I was very excited to see how they would get, gather you to come here. In a true dyslexic style, I got lost on my way to watch that performance. So I ended up in some other room. Um, but I did f find my way here. So it is my pleasure to introduce M Maya Scott. Maya is a blind interdisciplinary artist, labyrinth 
facilitator and arts educator living in San Francisco with her guide dog, Gleam. She is a member of the Labyrinth Society and has an MFA from the California Institute for Integral Arts. Scott teaches accessible movement, theater, and art at the City College of San Francisco. She is one of the artists in the art, art of the, the, the disability culture exhibition and will do, be doing a very special performance for us this afternoon. Everybody, please welcome Maya. Focus. Ready, three, take three. Uh, I wish I could have you zoom in a little through, but we can't, so you can stay right where you are, Joe. Movement one. I am seeing through a million eyes. None show the same picture now, soon and before. The media today states that I am a real woman. Well, gee, I am glad they approve. I am happy to know I am not an illusion or an automaton. They also say that any clothing over the size XL should be called goddess size. So, I sometimes can even reach goddess status. Wow, I'm a real goddess. I don't want to be in that box. Angry how people with nice bodies are called fake, plastic or photoshopped to make others feel better about themselves. Just because people are born to wear an aesthetically pleasing body or chosses to work hard to achieve it doesn't make them any less real than the rest of us. The art and myth that tells the story of everybody depends upon who is doing the telling. Movement 2. My perspective is the right one as far as I can see. Not far. Right now at least. Behold. <laughs> Movement 3. I was once asked how I came by my name. It was at some Wu Women's Empowerment Artsy event that drew spirit seekers and disillusioned middle-aged women. Her shoulder slouched with disappointment when I told her my parents saw it in a book and liked it. Oh, she said, I thought maybe you took on the name of the goddess of springtime. You know, for new beginnings and all that, I didn't have to wait around to be aptly named. I popped out with it in April at the heart of spring, the season of birth and creation, and I have spent my life being the artist, teacher and perpetual student. Growing things ideas, not plans, has always been in my bones. Possibly there is something to what I've been dubbing the midlife crisis goddess complex. Maybe there is power in a name. Maybe we innately embody these archetypes. Whatever the answer, I credit my life attributes to hippie parents, as well as the goddess who shares my name. Movement 4. The female symbol is supposed to represent Venus's mirror. I've heard that cross which is supposed to be the handle may as well be a hill. The mirror can be as dangerous and pointed as the sword. Movement 5. I can't help noticing how, when people are giving out free stuff, they reach over my head to give it to the presently aesthetically pleasing folks. It may be just as important to be seen by beauty as to see it. Movement 6. I am seen through a million eyes. I see myself in future primitive as I look upon that little headless, footless curvy goddess in red-orange limestone from Paleolithic times found in Willendorf. Through ages and cultures many goddess figures emerged with large heads, missing limbs and other exaggerations. Here today admired hanging around the necks of new age hippie sorts and shunned or pitied when such traits are seen in the flesh. Supposedly back then, they valued the excessively end out figure with her ample nether parts because she represented survival and health as food and shelter came sporadically. Then came the birth of Venus with her sleek nude form emerging from the sea. Today in cultures that have plenty, she is admired even worshipped also probably because she represents health and survival of the species through the trimming down of plentitude. Interesting, as with the birth of Venus how old church works the sacred feminine, associating loveliness with godliness drawing sheeple into the patriarchal fold. Curious, beauty is survival instinct, or the easy way in? Movement 7. Sadly, it is harder for most to find beauty in that which we love than to love that which is beautiful. Movement 8. Broken goods are not necessarily rendered of little or no use nor do they lose their value as their new state offers alternative ways of using them. So says the little piece of paper in my box of oil pastels. It took getting cut open and having an organ removed in order for me to apply this notion to myself. It took an offering. I created my own bathing ritual in my parents' upstairs bathroom to explore the contrasting more. 
soft skin and Jackie Rose of staples while avoiding the curly drain tube pin to my bandages, and the shame. I dared this days after parades of people scrutinized them. It wasn't a pretty ritual but it was mine. I played witness to someone else's art and body of work but it was mine. Movement 9. Parts of you are here. I may be, you, that vision, where ideals live.
everyone, Maya Scott. Thank you for your performance, Maya. And also thank you to all of the artists who have been here and who have contributed their art to the exhibit and also to, to the Palo Alto Arts to, for, for having all of us here and for having the art and for representing us. Because I think one of the most important things about disabled people doing art is that there is not the, the filter that we oftentimes see and it's a direct Net messaging from us. Um, so thank you to all of you for be being here and for being part of this. Next, I'd like to introduce Anton Hunter. Anton, also known as Purple Fire Crow, is an African indigenous, deaf, disabled, two-spirit producer, choreographer, film, theater actor, dancer, dance instructor, model, poet, speaker, mentor, and deaf advocate. He lives and works in Oakland. Amongst many other accomplishments, he has been producing the annual International Bay Area Deaf Dance Festival since 2013. He also curated the Bay Area Deaf Arts uh, uh, Exhibition at Soma Arts in San Francisco in 2020. You can see his work, the silent on view right over there, for art, our art of the, 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 the disability culture uh, 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 exhibition. Everyone, please welcome Anton. Oh. 
just about expressing yourself, right? You can't push that down. You're going to blow up. And we don't want that. So go ahead. Dance to express yourself in any way. Go ahead and copy me. Take your hands and lift them up above your head. And then bring them down in a tapping motion. Raise them up. And then bring them down in a tapping motion. There you go. One more time. Up. Tap. 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 So that's a sign for rain. So I dance when I'm sad. And I feel like rain. Like tap. Tap. So this dance is called rain.
Exhale. So you don't have to hold it in. Use your art to express yourself. Express all of your emotion. Like when you're cooking, or painting, or singing. La 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 la. Look, come on. How's the interpreter? She's singing all right? <laughs> <laughs> really, express yourself is so important. It's human and natural. Why? Because you all have a story. I can't tell your story. I can't. You only you know who you are. Deaf people have a story too. We have a rich culture. Me as a young boy, we would play this game, telling stories. I say, let me introduce you to my friend though. She tells great stories. Hi. Hello. So deaf people have stories, right? Of course we do. We have lots of stories. So like what? What story can you think of? to explain or show them deaf culture. Oh, we have ABC stories. ABC stories? Yeah, let me show you. We use handshakes with the letters to tell stories. It's really cool. I bet it's so cool. Show us. Take center stage. All right, so this story is called Jurassic Park. All right, you ready? So do you want to learn how to do an ABC story? All right, all right, here we go, you ready? Okay, so join me. A, hand shape is like this. Running, A. B, hand shape. Open the doors. Go inside, C. Pick up your binoculars, look around. D, over there, dinosaur. E. <laughs> F. Oh, clock, clock, clock. G. Go. H. Hurry, 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 hurry. I. A line. And then a zigzag line. K. Fell down. L. Oh, put a gun in. M. Brush it off. N. Looking around. Looking around. Oh, nothing's here. P. Oh, I'm so paranoid. <laughs> Q. Drops dropping on me. R. Oh, I realize. S. Oh, big stops. T. Good. R. And then two feet hanging out. W. Got me. Biting. Y. 
Nope, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting back. Why? Oh, fell down. Where? Over here? Over here? Over here? There they are. The end. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That was beautiful. Such a good story, right? Yeah. So storytelling is just the beginning. Later, I wanted to dance, but I was deaf and they said no. But really, dancing doesn't start with hearing, it starts with feeling, with that heartbeat. You can make that music from your heartbeat. And when I felt that, I pulled it out because that was my truth. You wanna see another dance? Yes, all right. I got it.
we all have. Those stories are so important. For our last dance, are you ready for it? So this dance is called Hot and Cold. So I'm going to call my dancer Zachary to help me. So, you know sign, right? I taught you a few. So this is a sign for cold, like you're cold, like you're holding your hands close to your body and shaking them back and forth, you got it? So when you're cold, it looks like this, cold, 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 right? Let's go ahead and try it with me. One, two, three, four, cold, 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 cold. One, two, three, four, cold, 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 cold. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, go ahead, put your arms down. So this is the sign for hot. Ready? Do you know what that is? Hot. You got it. Yeah. Hot. So it's a claw fist from your mouth facing out. Hot. Hot. We'll do it four times. Ready? One, two, three, four. Hot. 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 One, two, three, four. Hot. 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 One, two, three, four. Hot. 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 There you go. You guys are good. So we're going to do four colds and four hots. Do you think you can do it with me? Yes. I think you can. All right. One, two, three, four. Cold, 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 cold. Hot, 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 hot. Cold, 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 cold. Hot, 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 hot. Again, cold, 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 cold. Hot, 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 hot. Cold, 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 cold. Index finger moving from the mouth to the ear. Can, two hands pushing down and dance. Two, uh, the number two, facing down. The whole world can dance. Let's do it again. World, circle, can, two hands down, dance. Now the whole world can dance. Good job, everyone. My name is Antoine Hunter. This is my name sign. I'm Sana. Simon, this is my name sign. My name is Danielle Silk, and this is my name sign. We are Urban Jazz Dance Company. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us today. Hopefully we didn't overstay our welcome. I know that you're on a tight schedule, but we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antoine and his dancers, everybody. I think we all know that that was hot, right? Hot. <laughs> so we all learned that. Excellent. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you to all the artists who have contributed, and thank you for all of the organizers who have come. Um, it was a great afternoon, and I hope that we have many of these afternoons past October, just like Anton said. Um, and if you would like to share about this event and about the art, you can do that on social media media and you can hashtag it art of di di disability culture and also you can access this whole event on YouTube so please uh, spread the word about it and let everybody know and also th thanks to all of the organizers so please sh sh show some love to Kit Karen and many of the volunteers here and the interpreters and all of the camera people who are, who are working this. A lot of people put this all, all together. I mean, we got pizza. I mean, like, you know, that's everything. Um, so please enjoy the rest of the day um, and come back and tell your friends that this is open till December 11th. Thank you all.